I want to bring that up right now because uh, it's in the great type of No, no, I was. <laughs> Seven years later, my father was right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Joe McGovern. I'm a film writer for The Wrap. Um, and I actually had an introduction I was going to read out, but instead of doing that, why don't I just say, join me in welcoming Jacqueline Bissett. I'm really happy to be here. This is just thrilling for me. I just love it that you all came. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I, I wanted to start with just, uh, I tried to go online and count your credits, film and TV, and I tired out because there's so many. Um, they are. I you, haven't counted them, so there's, I, have, I kind of feel the same way you do. You've there's been too many in, of them. <laughs> in large films and independent films, yeah. you've been in films in English and French, mm -hmm. supporting roles, lead roles, um, TV, amazing work on TV. A short list of your co-stars, and I'll be, go through it quickly, is okay. Frank Sinatra, Candace Bergen, Anthony Quinn, Steve McQueen, Dean Martin, Tony Collette, Albert Finney, three times, Ben Kingsley, Paul Newman, Gerard Depardieu, Peter Sellers, Marcello Mastriani, Laurence Olivier, Isabelle Huppert, you've worked with Sidney Lumet, George Cukor, John Huston, Francois Truffaut, and, and actually many, many young and, up and new yes. directors. And very important to me are the two young friends of mine, Christopher Munch and Russell Brown, who directed this film. There was, those two films are super, super, super important to me. Russell and unfortunately, unfortunately um, they're not the, some of the most seen films, which is one of the really weird aspects of being in this business for a long time and not finding the work that you want to do and then finding it and feeling so grateful and so enriched. And then, unfortunately, the distributions are not as good. But that's, it's, that's the devil in the, uh, in the thing. It's, it's very hard to get those film, this kind of films out there. So things like this and meeting the public and you know, creating a desire to see independent films is very, very helpful to, for us. You mentioned Russell Brown, who's here. He's yes. the director of um, the, the, the beautiful film that I've just seen, um, Lauren and Rose, which is going to screen tonight. <laughs> and you mentioned Chris Munch, who directed The Sleepy Time Gal, which is yes. a film from 2001, 2002. It took a little while to get distributed, but once it did, uh, it I remember... It took three years to make it. Really? Mm-hmm. Amazing. We did it over a three-year period. It was a wonderful part, too. I want to bring that up during our conversation. And also, uh, before we finish, you guys will have a chance to ask um, Jacqueline some questions. So uh, think about what you want to know or whatever we leave out. Um, can we just go back to your uh, childhood in England? I'm curious about the first films you saw. I think I've heard Snow White was one of them. <laughs> um, well, I didn't... See films, basically. Um, my parents were into me reading books and stuff, and the we, films were basically non-existent. I think I saw three films in my youth. Um, we were allowed one hour and one and a half hours of radio, and we, my brother and I, we watched, listened to Journey into Space, which had us really excited, but uh, it was books, the garden and the animals and stuff like that, and we lived in a very um, <laughs> quaint house. It was a 400-year-old thatched cottage, very small, tiny, and uh, it was very, very full of books. My father was a doctor, and my mother had been a big reader, so there was a very little space. It was rather uncomfortable. It was very nice in the summer, 
because we could be outside, but in the winter we were, it was very, very small. And um, there were a lot of art books and there were a lot of medical books. And so um, my education was, was, you know, pretty good. I, I didn't know why we had so many books, but um, I think looking back, I think that aspect is really good that you read and, and I wasn't forced into anything. Um, my childhood was very average, I think. I was a very ordinary girl, and my brother was, you know, we were, you know, he sort of strung me up in trees and threw a ap crab, a <laughs> crab apples at me, and, you know, all that sort of stuff, and I thought, well, hey-ho, he's a guy, he gets away with it. And I, so I picked up this stool one day and hit him, and, and <laughs> which was, of course, my, and then I went crying to my mother and saying, oh, he hit me, he hit me. And she didn't know what to do because she, she didn't really believe me. Anyway, I got back at him once, but that was it. That was it. Um, we, ha we, we, my parents would go on Thursdays, which was my father's day off. They would go and see foreign films at this little fifth cinema in Reading. And... It was really the only day my mother would sort of dress up a little bit, put high heels on, and go, they'd go out. And I, I love this idea of them going to the cinema together. And at some point, my mother said, would you like to come see a French film? And I said, yes. And from that point, really, I didn't go often, but I started to see European cinema. And I just said, oh my god, what is this? What are these mysterious women and these handsome men? What is this world? I mean, completely out of my scope. And, and um, I didn't, up till then, I had seen Snow White. I'd seen The Mounting of Everest with the, the, when, what was the name of the man who discovered Everest? Hillary. Um, Edmund Hillary. Edmund Hillary. And, and I'd seen a couple of ballet films. But that was about it. So I was really uneducated in, 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 in everything. And... I used to think, well, I don't know what that job is, but I'd be really embarrassed that I'm actually thinking that's something that might interest me. I didn't even dare think it. It was so far away. I didn't know a single acting family or anybody. I didn't have any access to it. And my parents would, were not even thinking along those lines. But it kind of stuck in my head, and I was admiring the actress Jeanne Moreau. And what I liked about her was that she wasn't like, uh, super pretty, she was, there was something deep in her and slightly uh, subversive in a way. I saw her play a pyromaniac. I saw her play a woman living with two men, Jules and Jim. I saw her play um, sort of sometimes sort of slightly crusty women, but also very seductive women and just things that I hadn't seen before and I didn't know they existed. And I loved that. I was not so attractive to the, to the people who were very, you know, sweet and pretty. I, I, I thought they were pretty, but I didn't have that same feeling towards those women. And I wanted to discover the mystery of Jean Moreau walking down the street in La Notte, if anybody saw La Notte. And when I saw uh, La Strada with Anthony Quinn, and I said, my God, he was so handsome and so manly. And I mean, I never in a million years could have thought I would actually have a scenes with him, that he would kiss me. I mean, it's just mind boggling, <laughs> absolutely mind boggling. And then I tried to kick him in the film. Uh, it's one of my favorite films of my life is that scene where I attack. You know, and I, I want to bring that up right now because uh, it's in The Great Tycoon, which is a film, um, it's a, Speculation, I guess, on Aristotle Onassis and, and Jackie Kennedy, although the, you're not named that in the film. It's a Greek shipping magnate and an American first lady who hook up. Um, there's a scene where you're, he's, he's dining outside with his colleagues, his business colleagues, and you offer some suggestion to them, and he gets very angry at you and, and tells you it's none of your business and you need, to, you need to go away, and you walk off, and he comes and chases you. And you, for like... One of the only times I've ever seen in your career, you really let go and just wail on him and call him a slob and a bore. Yeah. Um, and of yeah. course, I think his response is, I want to make love <laughs> right now. Yeah. He, 
You know, sometimes you're doing a film and the young men or the older men you're working with, you feel they're fragile. They may be doing that, they're in their role, they're very good, but you don't feel you can go fully, really get let go on them because you're going to hurt their feelings, you know? Sometimes there's always that, you know, people are people. And with Anthony Quinn, I had no fear. I knew I could just give him hell, you know? I was just writhe, writhing with anger. And oh, it felt so good, so good. <laughs> You know, and I try and kick him, and he just, he treats me, he's, I'm like a fly for him. You know, he's a big guy, and anyway, I was a little fly, but an angry fly. <laughs> I love that scene. <laughs> did, you, did you feel with him, uh, when you were um, just talking about the film, uh, you know, not on camera, a sort of a kindred spirit in a way? S someone who had, a, who had a similar attitude about no, the business? No, not at all, not at all. No, I didn't. I didn't talk to him about things, that sort of ordinary things. We, during rehearsals, um, he was always wearing a tennis outfit. Um, he looked very sporty and he'd wander in and he'd ne there was no uh, really reference to anything other than the scenes that we were doing. All the women, on everybody was in love with him, you know, he loved that. Every, he was just definitely wanted all women to be in love with him, that was for sure. Um, he, he, he knew that I wasn't in love with him, so I slightly bothered him. Um, but... Um, what was, I'm sorry, I looked lost in my... Well, I was just wondering, if, because you have to, I think feel like to have a scene like that work, and it really does work, you have to, um, I think, have some sort of a shared attitude with your co-star. Well, we were in our characters, for sure. I was, my character was in love with him. Yeah. She was definitely, and she was used to being very powerful. And he, by the fact that he told her to go away when he was in the compa company of his colleagues, meant he was treating her like some woman who was, you know, not up to scratch in his life, so she was very insulted. But what, the thing was, the day of the shooting, this was, we, I, we were all costumed and everything, but I never saw any of his preparation, and, and there I am, we're in a taverna in Greece, and it's a scene when, uh, well, there's a sort of interaction between us. And he turns up, and I looked at him. I said, my God, he is Onassis. If he's Onassis, I'm Jacqueline. <laughs> Jacqueline Kennedy. And I'd been avoiding that truth. And I said, oh, my God. He was so real. He looked exactly like him, and he had the attitude. And I said, my, this puts me up the creek, because I hadn't prepared in that way. I didn't want to make a movie about the real people. I wanted to play these kind of characters. And I didn't want to be offensive to those characters in real life. And I was worried about slightly gossipy kind of stuff that I, every, I had accepted the script after about three or four changes on it, but I still didn't want to admit that there might be Jackie Kennedy. I hadn't studied her. So at that moment, it was a moment of, I have to sort of really reassemble my game and and he is an asses, and I'm married to him. And uh, it was okay. <laughs> I like being married to him. I preferred being married to the other character, my, the, the, the president yes. of the United States. But... Um, <laughs> That's a film, though, that I feel like the, the culture has caught up to, because yes. now with a lot of... Uh, everything's about... Um, well, you've worked with Ryan Murphy, actually, but he does a lot of these things about Gianni Versace or O.J. Simpson, the, you know, these, these uh, recreations of historical events. And mm. I feel like the Greek tycoon was there 30, 40 years ago. Really? Yeah. I um, don't know. It's a I lot of know. fun. Um, I want to ask about Mia Farrow mm -hmm. and how you said that in a, in a strange way, you kind of owe your career to her. Well, I, did I say that? <laughs> Not exactly in those words. Um, well, it was a, a, there was a, circum a happenstance. Yes, well, I was living in Hollywood, and I was um, living with a, my, my boyfriend at the beach, and um, I got a call to... I was under contract to 20th Century Fox. I had a sort of exclusive contract, a picture deal with them. I didn't have an exclusive contract. And they call me in, and I was preparing to go to Paris for a meeting on a father film. And the studio said, we want you to come in in the morning. And I said, why? What? They said, well, just come in and meet. You've got to come and see the studio da -da -da, producer. So in I went, 
and I didn't know what I was there for. I was just like, they said, well, we were thinking of putting you in this movie with Frank Sinatra. And I said, Frank Sinatra? My God, I mean, he was like the hero of my father's life, you know, and I, and I, and I, but doing what? They said, well, Mia Farrow and he are going through a breakup and the, you, you're going to replace her. And I said, Mia Farrow? It's like, this is just too much to deal with. And I said, but I'm going to Paris tomorrow. They said, no, you're not going to Paris, you're going to makeup. <laughs> and, and then my life sort of changed. They said, everything has to be perfect. Mr. Sinatra will not, he does one take, maximum two. Your hair has to be perfect. We want you to have short hair. You've got to look a little bit like Mia's character. And it started, the whole sort of the movie thing, the movie press thing started. And I had never had a press agent or anything. I was just living sort of hippie, hippie-ish life in, in LA. And, and I mean, it became really quite infernal. The, I was being called all the time and told to do interviews. And I just said, it, it, is this what it's like to be a successful actor. This is very difficult, and I, you know, I was th thrilled to be doing this thing, but I never knew how I'd got from zero to Frank Sinatra without, I didn't test for it, I didn't read for it. So life can hit you, you know, really, but between the eyes, I was just, wow. And then I went to England, and then the press picked up on it, and it became the girl who replaced Mia, and then they started gossiping about me potentially being in his life and all that Hollywood stuff, which was not true at all. He was, but he actually treated me very well and he was very protective of me, he called me the kid and uh, told the writer to get off my back at one point because he was being mean with me and he said, she has good instincts, leave her alone. And that was an, a massive thing to me. Somebody believing in me and um, you know, we have our script in the story, always we have our ideas about characters, but your instinct, as in life, is terribly important and um, it takes time. It took me a hell of a long time to believe in my own instinct, in life and in, in real life and in, as an actor. And I used to think if anybody was you know, a few years older than me, that they obviously knew much more than I did. So I would tend to give people the, you know, and listen to what everybody said. And I would be very quiet and I would think, gosh, I wouldn't have done it that way, but I didn't rock the boat. I knew that I was there by the grace of God, and um, I wasn't going to be a pain in the neck, and I wasn't going to behave like a, like a starlit or a star, whatever. And I just keep quiet and watch how people behave. And I did a lot of movies where and I got cast in a lot, with a lot of big stars, and that's what I did. I, I stayed quiet, and I watched. And I was very professional, even very young. It was just part of my English discipline. I was not, I didn't complain. I didn't expect anything. And that's a big thing when you're a young actor. You must not expect um, anything because you're an actor. I, it took me a long time to understand this. But you know, when you become, you start to get bigger parts and they give you a chair and then they put your name on it. And um, you go, oh my chair, you know, I'm on the set in Colombia, whatever. And I used to think, Miss Fain, and then they say, well, we're picking you up in the morning. Picking me up? Oh, and, oh, oh my God, I'm really getting hot here. And, um, and so on and so forth. And then a few years later, I said, I met people, I said, you have to understand, this has nothing to do with you. This is called looking after the pro produce of the studio. They give you a chair so you don't get tired, but also because they don't want you to get your costume dirty. They give you a car so you get safely from your home to the studio, and they take you home at night because they want you to be there in the morning. It's all about the production line. And that's the way, it, certainly, what I figured out it was for you know, in the 70s, and I'm sure it's probably the same now. But it, that's part of the reason you get this impression that you're doing so well. And that people think you're important or whatever. Um, and it, it amuses me now. And I see, I can tell very quickly who are the people are going to think they're entitled to this, that, and the other. Right. You are entitled to nothing in life. 
in my opinion. But it, it does require discipline it to discipline. not overindulge in, exactly. that, in that life. Yeah, I, I, I have an absolute thing about entitlement in, in, the, in the public and actors and all people who work and live in, on this earth. I think entitlement is a big mistake. You, you know, have to work, you have to earn it, and you have to be humble. Good for you. Mm -hmm. I want to actually leap forward to talk about a film that relates to this in a little bit. I mean, a, a couple of years ago when Parasite came out, everyone said it was one of the great thrillers about class, about the econ it was an economic thriller, but Claude Chevrolet made La Ceremonie uh, in the mid-90s, which you appeared in. Um, and those here who haven't seen it, it's a French film, it's very exciting, um, it's very thrilling. You play the bourgeois lady of the house, but I wanted you to talk about what color she wears, that she always wears white. Oh no, the point, oh no, she's, she's a bourgeois lady, she has two, a son and a daughter and a husband, they're everybody nice, they live in a nice house, and you know, but for, they haven't got a housekeeper at that point, so she is having to do everything, which she's perfectly capable of doing, but she hasn't been wearing her, her white for a long time because she doesn't have any help. So <laughs> she's wearing other things, and I thought it was just psychologically, she's in the kitchen doing what most of us do. We're in our kitchen, and we cook, and we get spots on our clothes, and blah, blah, blah. And at a certain point, the story builds, and we're a slightly pretentious family, and we like to watch opera. And we're gathered towards the end of the film in our living room, and I dress up in a white suit. And um, I suggested white because I thought, I, I'm about to get murdered. I thought it would be a good contrast. <laughs> and, um, and it worked. Blood red, you know. It, but the story is about, oh, I haven't got time probably to tell the story. People, People should go see it. I mean, it, yeah, they it, should. It's, 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 it's really available, good. it's available. Um, and uh, Isabelle Huppert is in it. Um, but Sandrine, I thought that was a- Sandrine Bonner. Mm -hmm. yeah. And was Claude Chabrol, was he someone who was one of those early, um, early in your life directors who you looked at um, and were very Not excited so much. By? Not so much. I was more, his films were a little more violent and were more, um, wasn't really my cup of tea. And I didn't know his work as well, but I, when I got the opportunity to work with him, I said, I want to, I want to, I want to discover. The story was about this family, right? They're having their life. And my character, hires somebody who's a, she's a, called in alphabet. Well, how do you, what's it called in French, in, in alphabet? She can't read. And she does, she hides it. And she's a very tortured character. But she manages to completely cover it. And we were surprised by her, her, her relationship with our, the family. She's kind of nice, she's quiet, she does a good job. She becomes friends with a lady in the post office who's played by Isabelle Huppert who you can be sure is up to something with Isabel, is always playing the most incredibly complex parts. And they gang together and they end up, they end up, um, they feel that it's horrendous. They end up killing us. And uh, the family, as we're watching the opera, in me and my white outfit. And, um, but it's very interestingly made. It's very interesting. And it's about the, the class system. It's about the class system. And the Ill issue is, in my mind, when you hire somebody, you give somebody a job. Are you helping them or are you robbing them from the, of their life? And that's the story really point. My character was always taking a little more time from her housekeeper. She was saying, could you stay on Sunday morning? We're having a cocktail. People are coming for lunch or cocktails. And the housekeeper would not, you know, she would do it, but she started to resent the family. And these sort of things were building up as a background. And all this stuff, of course, is going on in real life. It's not just a story. It was very, sh I was very shaken by that film, yeah. I saw it. Yeah, um, you were saying before about uh, being part of the experience of, of filmmaking, and I wanted to just bring up two of the sort of great ensemble films that you've been uh, a part of. Uh, Airport, <laughs> which we up. And uh, even better, Murder on the Orient Express, the original. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wonder, you know, because you're, you're, 
I think I've heard you say that you were disappointed a little bit by, I think, Murder on the Orient Express because you're just part of the the firmament, basically. You know, you're one of the many, many... I we, think all about it. we all were. All, we everybody. Yeah, right. we, there was no... Um, but give the list of who was in Lord Murder. Oh, my. I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, right. Albert Finney, Lauren Bacall, Isabel... Uh, I mean, um, Ingrid Bergman. Uh, Anthony it, Perkins. Perkins, right. Um, it, it goes... Uh, unbelievable. It, it goes on. Lauren Bacall. Yeah, you said Lauren Bacall. It was just lots of stars, and I had a small part. We were all so bored during the shooting because the only person who had to do anything was Albert Finney. And we, the only time, in my opinion, this is my opinion, was lunchtime. Because at lunchtime, everybody would sit around and tell stories. And this was fantastic. This was just fantastic. And then one day, there was an issue because they were trying, some of the people who were doing the film were also working in the theater in the evening. Uh, Ingrid Bergman was doing a play, Albert Finney, um, two or three other people. And they came to the union, came to see us and said, we want you to think about this. We want to cut your lunchtime one hour break to a half hour. I thought, no, 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 no. I'm not going to miss the only part of the film that I'm enjoying, which is the, it was lunch. <laughs> anyway, general, so they had this meeting with the, or all the people and, oh, oh to, um, Sean Connery was there. I guess, oh my God, all these very macho men. And Vanessa... So we cannot give in with this. We have to, we fought for it. We've got an hour for lunch. We cannot give in. And I thought, oh yes, she's so right. And the, Vanessa was very, very political. Absolutely terrifyingly political. And- um, She still is. Yeah, I know. Oh my God, you didn't dare say no to her. She was like, um, so they had a meeting, right? And we had to vote. And the vote comes up and everybody's, puffed up and all the men are looking very macho and the women are sort of, and, the, and her hand goes up, the only one, and my hand was up about this far up. And then I realized that it was not going in my direction. And I, I found myself thinking, what do I do with my hand? I couldn't make the next six inches up. I just, and I sort of did one of these sort of, um, uh, and I backed down and I felt like such, such a, such a weakling, but we gave in, and they took our half hour, and lunch was over. It's <laughs> too bad. And I thought, oh, and Vanessa was, at this point, was bright red in the face, completely flushed and fighting forever. She was up at six, you know, in the morning, and she was, she was incredible. She's an incredible actress, an incredibly strong, passionate woman in her causes, whether you like them or not, you know. She was totally admirable in many yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah. Wanted to talk about Albert Finney, um, and one scene that I, I'm sure you know what, what I'm going to talk about from Under the Volcano, where that's a film in which it's all sort of synced to the alcoholic haze of this main character. It follows a day in his life in uh, a very hot day in <coughs> Mexico, yeah. and I, and uh, you play his wife who's been gone and comes back, and he's sitting in a bar ranting to the bartender, and the door opens, and you're standing in the doorway, and he looks four times before he actually comprehends that it's you standing there. Um, it's a remarkable scene, a remarkable piece of acting um, for the stillness. Yes. There's no close-up in that scene. It's all shot uh, at a bit of a distance. Um, can it you was remarkable because Albert had been prior previous scenes, he'd been talking about how he dreamt of his wife returning to him. He was always drunk. The whole film, he's drunk, the whole film. So I had to find the level of fragility, not to be too present, but also to be there. Which It wasn't easy. It was a fine balance. So he's talked about her, and she appears. And I was filmed so well, and I, uh, we had a very good cinematographer called Gabriella Figueroa, who photographed me he photographed my soul. He didn't just photograph my face. And it is, for me, it was an incredibly important moment. I mean, Albert was brilliant. He looked, he'd been normal before. He was turned away from it. When he turned back, I mean, he looked like he'd been drinking for three days. And he, and he was a remarkable actor. He really was. But, but I was great. Gratitude was towards Gabriel Figueroa. Because I'd often said, God, Damn it! I see my rushes, and I the lights either too glamorous or it's ugly. It's not right. It's not the soul. It's the physique, your physical aspect, which can be. And I'm a bit obsessed about it because I can, I 
feel that light, lighting is love. It's that love or lack of love, or, and the withdrawal of a cinematographer looking at you and not pulling out of you what you have as an inside spirit is not good. It's, you've got to, I look for the beauty, not talking about perfection, I'm talking about the soul beauty, and it's very, very rare that I felt that I, that I was captured that way, and it remains one of very few characters that I felt that was right on the money. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's fascinating and, and great. Um, I wanted to ask about that, standing there though, the stillness, because there's, you, your face doesn't look like it changes, but it, it does. Your eyes, your mouth, there's molecular level changes there. Um, and that's a thread through all of your career. Really? Including tonight, when we're going to see uh, Lauren and Rose. Um, there aren't that many times where you've really broken down crying on screen, but we, but we do see this sort of, occasionally, the melancholy through your stillness, through your restraint a, a, as an actor, which is why it's so great in the Greek tycoon when you go wild. Um, yeah, but you've got to be careful with tears. It, yeah. You can make the audience very uncomfortable, and generally, if it goes on too long, you've got, you've got to fight it. You don't want to have, very rarely do you want to have a floods of tears. The audience just sort of waits, and they don't quite know where to put their own emotion. You're always dealing with the spaces between words that give the audience a chance to feel what they are feeling. It's all a matter of interpretation. As every, every time you see a film, you're judging through your body what you see and what you can relate to. And if it's too many words talking, generally it stops you from having your own feelings. But um, so tears can just, can, it's not that they're bad, but they should really not be let out completely. That's why often they just have, you know, you see the one tear appear in the eye. And I remember Jane Fonda in that film when she was playing a prostitute, what was it called? Clute. Unbelievable scene where she suddenly, had the, the tear comes down. I mean, there was such a pent up thing. And generally, um, I would say that, that that's a better way to go than having the full. What yeah. you saw in The Greek Tycoon was anger yeah. more than tears. It was just raw anger. You're right, though. I mean, if, if the character has that easy access to, to, to their tears, then where is the drama, really? You know, I mean, and, and like in, in Lauren and Rose, especially as the film progresses in the third, in the last third, you're, you're close to it. But that's, that's, the, the, that's the emotion. That's the drama, is being close to it. Well, I had the pleasure of working with Kelly Blatz, who's sitting here, there, Every and... Year. He was so incredibly good and helpful to me and gave me the chance to really, really focus on him and the feeling that we were going through, this love, this love platonic love story that we were going through. And I didn't have to make a lot of effort. I was just there. I was, I've never been more there, Kelly, than I, I think with an with a actor than I was with you. I don't think I really have, ever have. I don't think. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about The Sleepy Time Gal, a film, we, you mentioned a, a small film, but uh, another, another case where you're restrained, um, f uh, an amazing character, um, but in this film you're, you're being cared for by your son. Oh, um, he was very good. Nicholas Stahl. Nick, Nick Stahl, a very good actor. Um, and everybody who hasn't seen it should go, especially if, you, if you're a fan, I mean, it, it, it's, it's you at your most complex in all the sort of messy ways too. Yeah, it's um, a wonderful part. That's an, really another part. I play a woman who's at 53, she finds herself over, over uh, qualified to get any kind of a job. She's, she ha she's not well and she's got three boys. She's close to only one of them in the film, played by Nick Starr. And she's going through um, a lot of issues with her past. Seymour Cassell is also in it. And he's, uh, it's just, Wonderfully written and so complex. It took me a year, a full year, to get ready for that film. I heard that you wanted to have a very authentic American accent. No, that's Chris Munch wanted me to have. He did. No. But you, I heard you. I read that you said that once when you tried it, it took away your femininity. Completely. What, how, what was that? I, I was panicked. I thought. American, so many accents, which one would it be? If I'm in it, will I, I, will I know I'm in it? How will I learn this? 
because I'm very much a European person, and I'd been around Americans, but they all seemed to have different voices. Anyway, I learned the technique to do it, and I, every day I got on the treadmill for like an hour, did my exercise, and said my text with the American accent. And my mother was staying with me at the time. She said, what are you doing, darling? You're going on and on, on and on. And she was sitting there eating her chicken. And, um, and I said, I, I, I'm working, I'm working. She said, Oh, she's always working. My daughter's always working. And anyway, it was hilarious. And I wasn't making any progress. I really wasn't. And then I said, so I got the tape recorder and I tried to record myself hearing, but the sound of the treadmill was louder than the voice. So I couldn't really record what I sounded like. I just sounded completely unfeminine. Like I was, I had a, I'm not like a man, but not like a feminine woman. And this woman was complex. She needed to have many aspects. And I, I remember thinking, I'm never going to get this. What do I do? I, and, and then when I finally got it, I didn't know if I had got back what I wanted to have. And then Chris Munch said, less, less accent, less. I said, it's so difficult to do it less. It, it, more is easier. Less is really hard to be subtle, you know, and these complex speeches. And I, and I to that, and I, actually, I did that film, and I've done small parts of the American accent, more broad, broad things, but I haven't done many. I haven't done many. I'm scared of it. I'm scared of it. <laughs> you just mentioned your mom, and uh, I think you know a lot of us here, I know even me, I have had as well, uh, have had ex the experience of caring for our parents um, when they're not well, and uh, you did that um, for your mom. My mother got ill when I was 15, and she got... Um, uh, disseminating sclerosis, which is like multiple sclerosis, and then she got dementia in her early 50s. So I actually looked after her for almost 40 years. She was my responsibility, and that was a hell of a journey. That's the most incredible thing that I've done in my life by far. I was an amazing daughter. I have nothing to reproach myself, but but, um, but I learned so much, and it gave me it increased my humanity, and it increased my uh, sense of humor, and when she, the dementia got really quite bad, I learned to control my impatience. I learned so much. I learned to be with her and in her where she was, and not to be where I was telling her. And I learned the, that you cannot keep going, repeating, telling somebody they've already said that. It doesn't work. You have to be entirely on their side and go with it. And it just taught me so much. There were times when I thought, I cannot believe, my mother, she died at 85, and she got this when she was in, well, she was, I think she was 47, I think, when she got these two things at once. So she was a, you know, she became a real invalid, too, as well. And, um, and I wasn't sure that she liked me. When she was in all that stage, she would say, I'm quite fond of you. <laughs> As I cleaned her up and so on. Sometimes she would bite me, and sometimes, you know, she'd kiss me, but she'd also, she didn't know I was her daughter, and I'd say, Mommy, um, who am I? Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, who are you? And where are you? And I said, well, do you know, Mommy, I'm an actor? No, she said, I'm an actress. I'm an actress, she said. I said, you're an actress, too. She says, yes, I, I travel all over the world, you know, making films. I said, oh, do you? Where have you been? Oh, I've been all over. You know, I've been all over. I said, really, Mommy? She's sitting in the kitchen eating her chicken again. And, um, and so it went on. So that was, uh, I, learned, I learned to um, empathize fully. And, um, and I, it's a great, I mean, I'm sure many of you have had, uh, done time with your parents, but I really oh, yeah. had an exceptionally long time with my mother. My father had taken off and uh, but I think the phrase that it, it increased your humanity oh, is really totally the... Oh, it totally increased my humanity. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, the, that's the key thing, I think, to all yeah. of this. Um, I have a few more quick ones, and then we want to go to everybody else to ask some questions. Uh, I did want to go back to those days when you were living on the beach with your boyfriend, and I need to know something about... There was a... I've heard you describe this in an interview. It was some kind of a crate that was used to house a grand piano? That's what I was told. The house was the origin, was the origin. It was a packing crate. This is what you were living in? Um, we were living in a, yes, it was a converted packing crate made into, of a, which apparently contained a grand piano, which had been added onto. It was a tiny little house. 
um, it was a very folkloric time in the six, six, 1967, 68. Uh, next door, there was a family living in a, in a double-decker bus on the beach. They'd made it into a little home. <laughs> and then there was another very, very, very quaint house that was basically made of sort of cardboard and all the walls were covered with all the fashion magazine pi uh, pictures. Completely covered, everything was covered with pictures of beautiful models and stuff. And they lived there and we managed fine. But that um, we didn't, have, there was no heating, you know, it was just the beach and the Pacific Coast Highway behind. And he had a um, full set of drums, which he used to play a lot. And uh, I cooked and we had a very normal life there, you know. It was two actors living um, the life in a way. We didn't know we were, what was really anything. We didn't know about our careers. We were both st early starting and it was, it was good. I want to read a quote. Um, it's not from you, but I think you'll recognize who it is from. Uh, we live our life in a mirror. Everything is reversed. When we see a scene, it is received in our brain and reversed. The rays go out, cross, and are received in reverse. Real I did, I, it's not, I didn't say it. No, 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 not, oh. not, not you. Um, this is the important part. Re reality exists in the place where these two lines cross if we can find it. And that is from Rodney Collins' book, The, the Mirror of Light. Ah, oh, The Mirror of Light. Changed my life. But I don't remember that particular. Yeah, I had a very peculiar experience. I was in Paris, and I, there's a famous bookshop called The Shakespeare Company, which is in Paris on the, on the left bank. And I was with a friend, and we were browsing, and then he, he said, oh, that little book, that's an interesting book. Why don't you have a look at that? And I did look at it. And it, had, it was the book, it was a small book, and it was emanating energy. And it had been written, masses of notes on the side. I mean, it was just somebody or people had ex obviously loved this book, and I bought this little book and took it home, and I started reading it. And it was about the losing of the ego and the finding of the light, and I found the light. I saw the light, and I did not was go know what was going on with me. I saw something a bit like happened, sort of like the transfiguration, and it's this, I was changed by this experience, and it lasted about three months. I was changed by it, and I don't understand it. I don't know whether to believe in it. I know it happened to me, and it was called The Mirror of Light by Rodney Collins, and Unfortunately, like as always happens, you lend the book to a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't get it back. And it took me years to find another copy. And I found a brand new copy. And I thought, well, is it worth doing this again? But there was nothing written in it. There was no emanation. There was no energy from the book. And I looked at it and I read through it. And I, nothing, I didn't rediscover what it said. I'd already had the experience, I suppose, so it maybe would not have repeated. But I was so upset about lending that book. So don't lend your best books. Don't lend I think them. Or to write, even if you put your name on them, they don't come back to you. No. I would just think that for, for actors, I mean, for anybody, of course, but the idea of losing ego um, is one you have to really confront and, and grapple with a, a, as an actor. Um, I think you've got to get your ego out of there. Ex right. In life, yeah. if you can, because so much is reactive, reactive stuff. I don't know. I'm not quite sure if I've managed it, but I feel I certainly am not as egotistical as I might be if I hadn't read that book. I'm sure because I, as I read it, I understood a lot of things. Can't remember what exactly, but I no, I did. I know, but it gets in people's way so much, and this business tied into the thing of expectation and thinking that you're owed something. It's a danger area which you've got to be careful of. You have to serve the material. You're not asked, you're being hired. People say, well, you should always speak up. I said, no, you shouldn't always speak up. Sometimes you're speaking up about something that is a tiny thing, can upset the whole film. It's not about you, it's about the character, the director's in charge of his group. You have to sometimes go, yes, sir. And I used to have to do that with John Huston during Under the Volcano, because I remember feeling sometimes he, he, he would, I felt like I wasn't getting a chance to do what I wanted and I did make the mistake <laughs> of asking him if I could have a close-up. 
there was a, a second or two of silence and a sort of, and a nodding of the head. Is, and do you want to direct the picture too? <laughs> and, and I said, uh, no, but I just feel I need a close up. He said, yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Well, onwards, let's go on. No, didn't get my close up. And he was right. I didn't need the close up. But I thought I did. I really thought I did because the camera was quite far. And Albert Finney was getting a close up of him drinking. And he was opposite me. But John Houston was a toughie, you know. He was very good, but he was a toughie. There are so many tough directors. They're not easy. You know, that relationship is not an obvious relationship. Somebody telling you to do something which you actually have probably spent more time thinking about than they have, but you are there to serve the film. So sometimes you've got to be just a little bit obedient or, or, and, or just be a little bit clever. The best thing is not to ask, because if you ask, <laughs> you're not going to get the answer you want. you just got to do what you think is the thing and do it well. And you can sort of occasionally you can sort of slip it in, and, it, and they go, great, onwards. But if you start asking too many questions, <laughs> sometimes you get that look of, oh my god, this actor is just a pain in the neck. And, um, and it doesn't work. I, now, of course, Russell. <laughs> Russell was a wonderful director. And he was so playful. Russell is the director of Lauren and Rose. Yeah. And I... Yeah, he, he was so playful, and occasionally he'd give me a line reading, which is, you know, you have to, and I actually loved it when he gave me a line reading. He did, he was so funny. But it's, it's a day-to-day -day experience, isn't it, Russell? Yeah, yeah, it's a great experience when it's good. I, before we go to, go to the questions, I just also don't want to leave without mentioning um, you were in the final film of George Cukor. Mm-hmm. Um, legendary director and uh, rich and famous with Candace Bergen. Uh, uh, people have seen it. Um, but I wanted to ask because you were a co producer on that mm -hmm. film, and this was in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. It was very unusual in those days. What was that like? Not easy. Um, what can I say? I had been, I decided, I'd done a film which I thought was not a good film. But I'd been well paid for it. And I thought, well, this is the opportunity. If I do this film, I can now start to read material and see if I can find something that I can co-produce or produce or whatever. And I read a lot and I found various scripts. And amongst them was Rich and Famous. I did not know that it had been previously called, um, Oh, goodness me, I didn't know it had been made. It was a play that it, I didn't know. It was called an old, old Acquaintance, I think it was called. And I just knew it was rich, called Rich and Famous. No, it wasn't called Rich and Famous at the time. We found that title. Um, I found myself very unpopular. Um, it was a very much a man's world. It was not appreciated that I was one of the people who helped get the movie made. I was, at that time, I was kind of relatively, business-wise, I was kind of hot, and so I was able to get the financing. We were able to get the financing. But the, my experience was really very unpleasant, and I uh, was treated very offhandedly, and I felt that the boys' club were really ganging up on me, and, I, and part for Candy Bergen was absolutely wonderful to work with, and she was a support but she was unaware, really, to what degree I was suffering during that film shoot. But it was a wonderful part, and she had a wonderful part. So those bits were really good. But I, did, I had a partner who, with whom I did not get on. He was very jealous of me, and that was peculiar. But he just resented the fact that people wanted to talk to me about my involvement in the production side of it. And it was, it, it was not good. And George Cukor, <laughs> who was 83 at the time, he was he's very happy to do this film. He loved the script, it was incredibly well written. It really was, once again, two wonderful characters. Everybody, you know, you just, you just feeds you when you've got good lines. And um, 
So I had a bit of friction with George Cukor too, because he said, you never want to finish. You never want to go home, do you? And I said, well, no, I, I love working. He said, well, I am going home. I'm going home. And um, he thought I was a maniac. And he thought I was too enthusiastic. And he, but he was exceptionally bright, a colorful director, can, very cantankerous also. I mean, between, he had, he'd worked with all the great stars and he would scream at us, faster, faster. And as we were doing the scenes, I thought, I can't speak much faster than we are doing. But that was his focus, was he never wanted there to be pauses. He hated actors who paused in their lines. So I actually got to the point, because there were some small parts, I say to people, because they're gonna have their head chopped off, you know, I say, if you get, don't say your lines, but don't slow down and just don't stop and take a pause. For your own sake, I'm just warning you, because you'll have your head chopped off, you know. And they would look at me like, but they had every intention of milking their lines completely, which I knew they would be slaughtered. But I warned them if I could. I warned them and I would say, no, you can get a train through that gap, you know, stop, what the hell are you doing? And, and, and um, it, was, um, it was tough. And they were, huh? I just said, you know, I had like three lines and I wanted to spread them. Oh, get that screen time. <laughs> Who here has a has a question for um, yes? It, the detective. The film with Frank Sinatra. Yeah, the detective. Um, yes. Oh, I, I want to know if you ever fell in love with one of your leading men. It's a question. I did, I'm sure yes, repeat. I did. Yeah. It's a question of whether you I fell did. in love with on your my leading first men. Film, on my first film, I did. Before I'd gone to Hollywood, my father said, you don't want to get involved with actors. They're not, not, they're not suitable. Not suitable. No. And I said, Daddy, what do you know about actors? Well, I know. He said, I know about people. He was a doctor. Good doctor. Very psychologically sound, he was. First actor I met, fell in love. <laughs> Seven years later, my father was right. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. Do you want to tell us his name? <laughs> my the, first, yeah, the name uh, of my of my uh, Michael Sarazen. Michael Sarazen. That's yes. where you lived in with, in the yes, uh, yes, yes. We lived, yeah, yeah we lived in this uh, converted packing crate. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody over there? Yes. Um, did you go to acting school? Question: I, Whether you went to acting bit, school? A little bit, a little bit. But I did start in London. I tried to work with a with a woman um, teacher. I did. I didn't care for it at all. I didn't like what. I felt pretentious and I didn't like it. And um, when I went to Hollywood uh, shortly after that, the, there was a school called, it was called the New Talent Program and they asked me if I wanted to join it for a few weeks and I did and I really, really enjoyed it. That we had a teacher called Kurt Conway who was good. And, but their attitude, I didn't like the attitude of what we were being prepared for. They said, we had a lady called uh, Miss, uh, Pamela Donova and she said, you are being groomed for stardom. <laughs> and, and, I, and I said, couldn't we just start learning to act first before we get this? <laughs> when you go to the dining room, you must wear stockings and dresses, dresses and stockings, and you'll be seen by the people who are in the, in the dining room. You might be spotted. You might be spotted as you walk through. So dress properly like young ladies, you know. And she didn't have the English accent. She had the American version of that. I'm not good at that. The voice. And I thought, this is astonishing. And I was wearing my corduroy jeans and my, you know, my English. I just come from England. So we were not into the same thing. But um, that, was the, that was what I survived. <laughs> and, and there was lots to learn. You could ignore the high heels and the stockings. <laughs> Sir. I didn't feel like it. Well, you know, you take the time. You you have to do that, but that's part of being an actor. But I didn't think about 
that once I was working with Kelly. I didn't, I mean, he was what I was focused on. And that was pretty much non-stop, wasn't it? We were, I was not thinking about the camera. Those moments were so full, you know, it required really concentration and, um, and the wonderful text we had to say. But he wasn't as belligerent as a director when you asked for a close-up, I guess, as John Huston was. No, no, no. Did I what? Have fun making the film class. <laughs> I did, actually. I did. I got a little bit, when they told me that I had to lie back on the bar and get somebody to throw a bottle of liquid down my throat, I was a bit taken aback how to, how to do that. I'd never done that. It was in the early part in the scene. It's just sort of glug, glug, glug some, some alcohol. Of course, it wasn't alcohol, of course. But there were a few things where I had to adjust to those bar habits. Of that of that place, but um, I did enjoy it. And Andrew McCarthy was was charming. And when I I felt very self conscious with him, he was so young, and he looked so young, but he was very intelligent. And we got on; we were good friends. But there were moments in that story where the film shifted because actually, when I read that script, it was not exactly a comedy. It was quite a poignant script, and the producers decided to go for the comedy, so it became like a a young, a young boy's sort of dream of meeting older woman, younger man type story, and it got a bit goofy. And when I saw the film, I, I was annoyed that I, my character had not been taken to where it was supposed to go. I, you know, I wasn't thrilled with that, but it did fairly well, as a, it was quite successful. Okay, yeah, so, too, uh, too so much. this is. <laughs> I, <laughs> all right. No. So, favorite and least favorite directors and actors. No, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. No. <laughs> no, sorry. No. I mean, I, I can. I. <laughs> no. Challenging. Well, the two most challenging roles I've had are, is Lauren and Rose and The Sleepy Time Gal. Those are the two most. And the. the they're the most interesting experiences I've had. I've done uh, Rich and Famous was a very rich, rich story and, and script, and there were various other ones that were over the years. But in true, purely as an actor, those were the two films that excited me the most as an actor. Two more. Let me see who over here who has it. Yes. The films that captured well, your... Inner... I don't know. It's not, a, it's not about me. It's not about capturing my thing. It's a ca capturing the soul of the character. And uh, um, in my opinion. But I... Not so many, you know. I've, I mean, the, you're playing... I've done all kinds of films, and I've done a good job in a lot of kinds of things, and others I've been stronger than others, but and less good when the script wasn't as good, and so on. But... Um, you know, I think generally I've been fairly lucky that to have picked things that were I had a chance to do, you know, a reasonably good job. But I'm not quite sure what I can, uh, how to answer your question. Okay. One more. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, my, my parents wouldn't let me watch your movies uh, growing up because they thought you were too sexy. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> That's over now, you know. <laughs> Just, I don't know. You can watch them now. <laughs> They, they, I was. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, the character was the character was scared of being in love with a guy who was younger than her. And she says a line which I always found very touching, which she says to Candy when they're standing outside in the snow in in in, in New York, and she says, "I'm. I don't want somebody watching me. My thighs grow old." I thought that was a. Very truthful line. <laughs> but she loved that. She loved that character, you know. Yeah. 
she loved. It was very sad, I thought. And they misunderstood each other at the point that she'd actually become stronger. He, he was lost. I want to Thank wrap you. up uh, by um, speaking of, she mentioned ageism, but um, you are 77. I want to yeah. astonish the audience by saying that. And here we have tonight, Lauren and Rose. I mean, you know, the, the, there's, there doesn't seem like there's any slowing down um, for, for you, at least, uh, professionally, and I'm sure personally as well. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you do like to garden, I know. <laughs> well, my five-minute mile is not very frequent. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, what's the question? Are you, are you going to... Are you, is, there, is retirement a word that you know the definition of? Well, I don't know. I mean, it depends how the movies do and if people want to put you in another film. I think, I think Lauren and Rose is going to give me a little few more years. Good. I think, you know, I think. But you never know. Hmm? Or life in the old bird. But, yes, life in the old bird, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> Nobody knows anything can happen in life. We're at the stage now where the world is so chaotic. I mean, I don't know. It's, one doesn't, I don't know about you guys, but I wonder, where should one be living where one is safe? Is there a place where there's anything safe? No, there isn't. There's nowhere between the weather, the politics, disease, and, and I, mean, I think probably if you live here, you probably feel fairly safe. Hmm? Hurricanes? Hurricanes. Really? They're disagreeing about this, but... Um, well... Do you, do, you, um, do you currently live in the U.S. or in the U.K.? I live in Los Angeles. You do? Mm -hmm. And I worry about fire a lot there, where I live, terrified of it. Yeah, I live in the canyon and it's, um, it's very overgrown and there's nothing you can do about it because it's not your property. You can cut your own property back, but... Do you get back to England often? I haven't much because of the COVID. Yeah. I've basically been in America for about two years without hardly leaving. I want to end by mentioning that in 2010, you received the Legion of Honor from the President of France. Mm -hmm. the, the, the highest honor. And I want to echo Nicolas Sarkozy by saying, he said at the time, you are a icon of movies. And that is what we agree with, oh, uh, a movie thank icon, you. Jacqueline. Thank you. I don't know about being an icon. I, am, I just see myself just as a woman, that's all. Just as a woman. Thank you so much for, for joining thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you.